Hey, you made it. Welcome to my place. Come on in, kick your shoes off before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series. Just a few quick announcements. First, I am very excited to announce that Potterless is going to be a part of Listen Up Portland, a podcast festival happening in February of 2019 in the Rose City. Potterless will be having a live show. Horse will be having a live show and Spirits will be having a live show. The Potterless show and the Horse show are on the 17th of February, which is my birthday. So please come and make me feel like a very cool person. If you want to check out tickets, you can go to listenupportland.com. There's a bunch of different ticket packages. There are so many great shows as part of this festival. I'm very excited to be there. Obviously, Multitude will be doing a meetup in Portland, so stay tuned for details on that. But yes, get ready. February, Portland, listen up. It's going to be great. In fun social media news, user Andre11x created the Potterless subreddit. You can go to reddit.com slash r slash Potterless if you want to discuss the show, and Reddit is your preferred method of doing so. It's a fun time. There's already some great threads. I'm excited to see that grow. If you aren't following Potterless on social media, first, what are you doing? But second, you will have missed that as a Christmas present, I put up an episode of Maturity Corner where me and Johnny make fun of the movies on Patreon. So if you want to check that out, go to patreon.com slash Potterless. And as I mentioned before, starting with this episode, Potterless is now weekly, and because of that, the Patreon is restructuring a bit. So if you go to patreon.com slash Potterless, you can see a text post explaining how the charges are going to change. Just a heads up for anyone that was thinking about joining Patreon or for anyone that already has Patreon and you want to see how those charges are going to change. So you can see if you need to drop down, which is totally okay, or drop out, no harm, no foul. Again, all the information there and all the other bonus content at patreon.com slash Potterless. And speaking of Patreon, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Alina Utkina, Manuela Frey, Nina Jasilek, Harper Caldwell, Catherine C., Kat Dickinson, History Duo, Ariana Reinhardt, Marissa Goldstein, Fatima Rahman, Melanie Verhoef, Melia Parslow, Alyssa French, Mary, Kira Salmanen, Hope Rulestone, Linnea Siever, Kendra Holstrom, Emily Coseo, Anna Marie Laveri, Vera Kiskila, Scott Novak, Hannah Tabo, Cassandra Rascon, Megan Kirby, Louisa Del Guidice, Katie, Sasha Immel, Celia Evans, Alina Gillon, Hilary Ballantyne, Amy Sforzen, Meg Chatterjee, Helene Fiska, Nicole Curtis, Gemma Colmans, Emma Forzelius, Kendra Hertz, Emma Livingston, Emily Cast, Ashley Hunt, Lena, Jeff Forrissey, Dave Coates, Craig McRoberts, Wizard Toaster 85, and Luke Tuomlo. A shout out to Selena Soderberg, Monique Buffet, and Ben Silver, who upgraded their pledge, and a huge shout out to Aaron Rapp, who upgraded to producer status, as well as our new producer level patrons, Jane Lance, Will Barrington, and and Kerry D. Bagginson. They join the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Alex, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Jenna, Kieran, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Benjamin, Rosemary, Jill, Maria, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Anthony, Russell, Dustin, Katie, Audra, Indiana, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossanne, Micah, Andrea, Nikita, Colette, Chrissy, Shrina, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Lovekesh, Shivani, Ali, Calmage, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Jeremiah, Sarah, Jesus, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Natalie, Arna, Brandy, Melody, Kristen, Jonathan, Zach, Elisa, Tiago, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Jonathan, Joe, Isabel, Steve, Vivian, Samuel, Victoria, Elena, Takari, Darlene, Brennan, Drake, James, Haley, Marino, Brayden, Matthew, Hannah, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Peter, Maria, Phineas, Natalie, Hermione, Victoria, Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Cecily, Raul, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Heidi, Alexandra, John, Jen, Juice, Sefrin, Dusty, Noel, Tao, Hala, Emily, Michael, Robin, Rebecca, Taya, Patricia, and Can't I Potter? Who never break their New Year's resolutions, they stick with them all the way through the year. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, director's commentary, exclusive merchandise, just head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. Thank you to our sponsors, Stitch Fix and Backblaze. And without further ado, let's get into episode 58 of Potterless covering chapters one and two of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, guest starring Multitude's own Amanda McLaughlin. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the journey of a grown man reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I am that grown man, and I am here joined by a guest that people have been yelling at me for ages to get back on the show, and I've been saving it for this moment because it's the beginning of the last book. Amanda McLaughlin from Spirits and Join the Party and Waystation and Multitude as a whole. Amanda, how's it going? Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. You listen, the fans have made their desires known. They have. And here we are. No, I'm I'm really stoked. I don't think I've actually reread Deathly Hallows since it came out. Oh, wow. Uh, where every, like, as every Harry Potter book came out when I was a kid, I started reading with book one. Um, mm-hmm. I would reread the previous ones up to that midnight release. Uh, yep, bring them to the parking lot usually. Thing. 
Yeah, but obviously <laughs> Deathly Hallows, that did not happen. And sure. uh, it was really cool to dive back in. I reread Half-Blood Prince with you oh, nice. as the episodes came out. <laughs> yeah, so that I could, you know, be in the same headspace as you are uh, for this for this exciting journey. I love it. Yeah, I have to say, I think the biggest advantage for me waiting until so long that all the books are already out is that I didn't have to wait all of the time in between the two books because how much time was between six and seven? Wasn't it like two years or something? I don't actually know. Let me look that up. I think it was long. It's it seems I would uh, I, I, it would be so painful for me because the ending of six did not give any closure at all in terms of anything. No, it was incredibly difficult. It was not a great, <laughs> uh, a great wait. So Half Blood Prince of 2005 and Deathly Hallows. I think I remember this off the top. Yeah, 2007. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was a full two years. Not as long, I think, as Goblet of Fire to uh, Order of the Phoenix, but it was brutal. And we knew the title, but at that point it wasn't helpful. Yeah, so that's the thing is that even if you know the title, it's Deathly Hallows. No idea what that means. I have no idea what that means. And I realized this and I tweeted about this, but this is the only time that I've gone into a book knowing absolutely nothing about what happens. Yeah, that is very exciting. Because I've seen the first four movies, pretty much knew what was going on in those. Five, I knew a little less because I'd seen half the movie. Six, I didn't know any of like the smaller stuff, but I knew the big Snape kills Dumbledore situation. Right. And for this book, I know literally nothing. So I'm super excited in that I couldn't tell you anything except for, I guess, the epilogue stuff that, you know, but that that's all just minor. I don't really know what's going to happen over the course of this, and I'm very excited to find out. Yeah, and some Harry Potter fans don't even count the epilogue as actual text. They they disavow that completely. Ooh. So you truly don't know anything that happens in any of the last book to some people. Nice. Well, I will take it. So <laughs> let's get started right off the bat. Chapter Hold one. Hold on, Mike. Oh, yes, I have yes, to stop yes. you. Okay. Because I took notes on the epigraph. That's the kind of nerd that you've invited on. There's a wait. What is, there's an epigraph or is that the dedication or is that something else? It is after the dedication, my friend. Oh, the thing written by William Penn? Yes. So there are two quotes. There are two quotes that open up Deathly Hallows and I'm going to make you read them like the English teacher I have within me. Well, I'm going to read them out right now, live recording of it because I purposely just like breeze past these because I don't like to know the chapter titles because sometimes the chapter titles give away spoilers. These ones are okay. Let's let's do the first one first. This is by Aeschylus, a play called The Libation Bearers. I am so glad that you pronounced that because I would have butchered that. I thought that when I started reading it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would have just been the customary spirits way to mispronounce it and then get yelled at. So this poem goes, Oh, the torment bred in the race, the grinding scream of death and the stroke that hits the vein. The hemorrhage none can staunch the grief, the curse that no man can bear. But there is a cure in the house and not outside it. No, not from others, but from them in italics, their bloody strife. We sing to you, dark gods beneath the earth. Now here, you blissful powers underground, answer the call, send help. Bless the children, give them triumph now. Sounds like a very dark poem, and uh, my stupid brain can't process what it means. Yes, so that is from Aeschylus. Uh, this is from a play, uh, a trilogy called the Oresteia. So this was an ancient Greek playwright. Okay. And from the Wikipedia page, because I'm a scholar, mm-hmm. it tells us that the principal themes in the trilogy include the contrast between revenge and justice, Ooh. as well as the transition from personal vendetta to organized litigation. Uh So it's basically the capital G T Greek tragedy about, uh, you know, people dying and killing their parents and the brothers and sisters and like blah, blah, blah. And there's a whole lot of Greek drama. Um, But this, this excerpt is really saying like, Hey, you know, the, the children need help. There is a real, real problem here. And the answer is not outside the world that you know, but within it. Wow. Okay. Awesome. I'm so glad you're on this podcast. Shall I read the second one? Please do. (laughs) Okay. Death is but crossing the world as friends do the seas. They live in one another still, for they must needs be present that love and live in that which is omnipresent. In this divine glass, they see face to face, and their converse is free as well as pure. This is the comfort of friends, that though they may be said to die, yet their friendship and society are, in the best sense, ever present because immortal. This is William Penn, who probably should go to an English class because that was garbagely written but i get the sentiment behind it (laughs) and that is from a collection called more fruits of solitude um Mm -hmm. which is as you may guess uh older it was published in the 1800s yeah i was gonna say this had to be like some old ass english shit the way that he said these sentences and just decided to throw commas in for fun like he was sprinkling salt on a dish not only is it old ass shit it's also old ass quaker shit so william penn was a famous quaker 
And this is from a book of aphorisms, which are just like nice sayings to live your life by. It's very famous, like Seneca from Roman times did it. It's just like people like to just publish quotes that they either made up or heard or want to mm-hmm. be known as. And doing my research for this episode, um, Professor John Granger is called the Hogwarts Professor. So it's HogwartsProfessor.com. It's a, it's okay. a guy. Of Wait, a is his actual, is his actual is last name Granger yeah, yeah, yeah. or did he his change it? His actual last name is Granger. <laughs> uh, I haven't looked at his birth certificate, but I had the exact same thought. But anyway, he did the legwork for me um, and published an essay about how every sentence so this looks like a paragraph on the page, right? It looks like just a normal paragraph. Yes, sentences. I thought when I started reading it, that would make it easier to read. It makes it a lot harder to read. <laughs> When it's a poem. It does make it harder because actually these are just individual sentences that Rowling decided to put together into a paragraph. So oh. Granger's point in the essay is kind of like, this is not what it was initially. Wow. They were, you know, not intended to be a paragraph. They were just intended to be like little instructions. So, you know, uh, this is the comfort of friends that though they may be said to die, their friendship and society are immortal, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And like that, that isn't meant to be a one whole like thesis statement. So I think it really interesting that like Rowling decided to put to like smush together a bunch of quotes from one book into like a, a philosophy to sort of prime the reader's brain as they get into this book. But more importantly, William Penn is a Quaker and Quakers are called friends. Uh-huh. That is like they're like what you would call a congregant, right? Or like a member, sure. uh, whatever, like they are capital F friends. And that is how it is written in the book with a capital F because they're talking about Quakers. Mm-hmm. So Granger is pointing out that like, these aren't friends like your buddies, <laughs> the bond of the friends that these sentences are written about is well beyond, I'm quoting here now, the casual brother homeboy acquaintances or even partisan political or denominational religious association. So I, I don't point this out just to be pedantic, even though I think it's really interesting as a uh-huh. like, you know, textual person, but but also because these friends that are being talked about here are like religious cohorts. Like they have chosen a lifestyle, a philosophy, a life experience that makes them closer than family in this life and the next. And so as we go into Deathly Hallows, like this is what JK Rowling decided to use as her like primer for the book. And near the end, like, you know, as we go throughout the book, you're going to see how like the ideas of friends and family of like brotherhood of commitment, you know, before and after death, like these things mm-hmm. are what the book is is founded on. So um, I thought it was really fascinating little uh, little tidbits to start us off with. Yeah. First off, thank you so much because I didn't even know these were in the book. Second, everyone that says this podcast is stupid and doesn't actually have any deep analysis, uh, suck it. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Amanda has brought the smarts to the pod and I'm going to dunk on this book uh, for the next hour. I'm ready. <laughs> so, Let's do it. No, that's really cool. That's fun. Interesting call by JK just to kind of like take some random senses and put them together but you do get the overall message hey friends are important i'm guessing she used this as an allusion to the squad but you know we'll see how it all comes together we'll see we'll see i mean that that's how life is right like you pick up you know little sentences along the way pieces Mm -hmm. of advice people give you and then looking back retrospectively like all the sentences get smushed together and become like your your take on life unless you think about it more proactively so if folks out there want to look up that source it's professor john granger the hogwarts professor nice well thanks john granger and thanks amanda so let's get into the actual book part chapter one the dark lord ascending so hit the ground running with a ominous title for the first chapter and it opens with two Two men appearing out of nowhere. I'm guessing this means they apparated. And one asks the other news and the other replies the best. This person that replied <gasps> Severus Snape. So I got very excited initially because this means another not told from Harry Potter's perspective chapter, which are my favorite. Hell because yeah. Because you just get such a fun twist on the perspective when somebody else is narrating. And I was also reminded at the beginning of this book, right? So like we have two men appearing out of nowhere, a narrow moonlit lane with their wands at each other's chests before they recognize each other and then put mm-hmm. their wands away. And I immediately flash back to like the opening of Sorcerer's Stone Ooh. where we have McGonagall as a cat watching the Dursleys doing their coming and going. Uh-huh. We have Dumbledore arriving on Privet Drive. We have Hagrid mm-hmm. and a motorcycle dropping off baby Harry. And so it's just like really interesting to me, just like the idea of a like a vacant lane and then someone appears out of nowhere. Yeah. And instead of all those pure examples of people like looking after baby Harry and bringing him into a new world, we as the readers are being brought alone to meet with the Dark Lord, which has not yet happened. Happened and no. signals to me the fact that like 
shit's popping off. Oh, yes. This is where we're at now, and no one's around to save you. Yeah, things get very real. So we learn that this other non-Snape Death Eater is Yaxley. Uh, That's a name, but I'm guessing he's just going to become a throwaway Death Eater that we haven't cared about before, or we won't after. Basically, you get the sense that they are heading to some sort of a meeting with Voldemort, and Snape is, I thought, going to be delivering the news about the murder of... Dumbledore because we don't really know where this fits timeline wise I later realize I'm wrong yeah actually also asks Snape you sound confident that your reception will be good which I was like whoa I guess the Death Eaters aren't completely convinced of Snape standing among them either Mm -hmm. you know like we talk um, at the end of Half-Blood Prince where like all of the squad and the professors are in the castle being like what the fuck like Snape did I trust him did he not blah 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 and I was like oh damn like he is a double agent and that means that probably neither side is ever going to be completely confident of his loyalty yeah we kind of get that vibe in the beginning of the sixth book when Bellatrix very much makes it clear that she doesn't trust Snape. So the vibe that I got from Bellatrix was that Voldemort completely trusts Snape and everyone else is kind of fishy on it, which is kind of funny that it very much mirrors the Dumbledore situation where Dumbledore really trust Snape and then everyone else is kind of fishy on it so so it's this weird thing where like nobody trusts Snape except for the most powerful good and the most powerful evil wizard (laughs) yeah and everyone else is like I don't know about this guy and both of them are completely orthodox about it right Mm -hmm. like both of them are like don't question me I know more than you know and as you may have picked up by now like fandom loves to debate the morality of Dumbledore of Snape like people talk about whether or not these uh these characters are actually as good or bad as we are meant to see them as Mm -hmm. and so it, that's a really fascinating parallel. I agree. I also picked up here. So as Snape and Yaxley are walking toward a manor, mm-hmm. it says that they walk right through these like elaborate gates as though the dark metal were smoke. Yeah, just with their hands stuck out. Yes. So that also, to me, represented some of Harry's first entrances into the wizarding world. For example, through the brick wall of Diagon Alley and then through Platform right. 9 and 3 quarters. Yeah, literally through a brick wall that just kind of vanishes around you. Yeah. Wow, look at all these parallels but evil versions. So as they progress, they hear a rustling, which turns out to be a pure white peacock, which we later learn that this is Lucius's, so it makes sense. But doesn't this defeat the purpose of a peacock? Like, the whole point of a peacock is that it has a lot of colors. And Lucius is like, I'm so racist. I want one that's only white. Yeah. And also, like, <laughs> we are walking into a den of pure evil. Everything is dark around us. And so I was just kind of puzzled by the fact that it's a pure white bird. Like, is this meant to be reminiscent of, like, Dumbledore's brilliant white memorial that we found uh-huh. at the end of Half-Blood Prince? Is it just supposed to be, like, an irony because, like, everything around you is, like, black and therefore coded as evil, except for this one, like, heavenly bird? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Or is it just Lucius loves all pale everything. It's definitely not uh, conscious. It's definitely just that Lucius loves to be weird. Uh, but yeah, here we are. <laughs> the thing about a peacock is that it it seems like the perfect bird to have by an evil villain. Oh, for it sure. It just seems like the most intimidating. Like that Alexa Super Bowl commercial where Anthony Hopkins is feeding cheese puffs or whatever to a peacock while he's being creepy. It just makes sense. Yes. Because it's just this confusing, like, I don't know if this peacock is pretty or if I should be terrified of it. I feel like if I saw a peacock, I'd just think... I'm not messing with this thing and I would be scared even though it's not like a Rottweiler or whatever. (laughs) Well, there are uh, scarier pets and scarier people waiting within. There are. So we learned that this is Lucius's manor and they progress into his house and they go to a room which inside has a long ornate table with people silently sitting around it. But it's not just a table with a bunch of people. It's casual. It's fine. Don't worry. Yeah. There is also a unconscious human figure floating upside down slowly rotating as if suspended by a rope uh, of which just a just a few words here what the fuck i'm sorry what is happening <laughs> yeah it is very scary it was very scary to me again we get these books at midnight so you know mm. you start reading immediately and the cash register <laughs> at barnes and noble uh and then you go into the car and then go back to your house and read all night long until your parents yell at you to get up in the morning of and course. then you fake a sick day and read harry potter but <laughs> this was genuinely terrifying to me i remember reading it at the time and if my memory serves they also reproduce the scene in the movies which Ooh. was another just like it's it seems very cinematic mm-hmm. um and it rolling obviously knew that her books were being adapted into movies at this point as she was writing but i, I can't help but think that like this is a war book you know oh, and, yeah. and the entire time as you're reading you know i definitely encourage you to picture this as a war movie like the mm-hmm. you know big sweeping landscapes like close-ups like melancholy color palettes like i mean the <laughs> whole the whole thing um to me reads as, as really really cinematic john fogarty 
Brody and Creedence Clearwater Revival songs as they trudge through the forest. Yes. The classic elements of any war film. <laughs> so a high-pitched voice from the end of the table says, Yaxley, Snape, you are very nearly late. So clearly this is Voldemort, but you are very nearly late. That's another word for on time. <laughs> I don't understand. Well, oh, you are almost late. It's like, I'm, I'm here. I made it. You said come at eight. It's 7.58. I'm here. <laughs> I don't get why he needs to like scold them. I don't know. The Dark Lord has to nag them <sighs> into being followers. So he has to find something about it. I guess Voldemort is just everyone's dad that says you're late if you're five minutes early. And like oh, pff, my least favorite phrase ever. <laughs> now I'm picturing Voldemort like yelling at Death Eaters about like not emptying the dishwasher, which is a very <laughs> good image. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love it. Oh, pick up your feet when you walk. Don't scuff your shoes like a classic <laughs> dad move that he's yelling at them as they go around causing, <laughs> causing a ruckus. So the narrator then goes on to describe Voldemort, and he is described as more snake-like than he has ever been, saying that his eyes are pure vertical red pupils, which I'm kind of bummed that the movies never did. He has basically normal humanish eyes in the movies. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't go with the very snaky eyes for movie Voldemort. I was also really curious about the choice of the color red here. Mm -hmm. That obviously makes sense for actual reptiles, especially just coming off of Half-Blood Prince. Like I closed Half-Blood Prince, opened Deathly Hallows, and here we are. <laughs> it's like a murky green purple cover compared to like an orangey red cover. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember when we saw the cover design for the first time, this is like the brightest that the colors have ever been. It Previous, has. it was like a maroon was the brightest color. Mm -hmm. And so I remember just being like, wow, like this is different like what does it mean what does it signify just like grasping for meaning yeah and especially here like i don't know it's it, it, red signifies bravery and boldness in gryffindor but also here it is um a signifying something like reptilian nocturnal evil yeah and um please pay attention also to kind of color descriptors and okay. coding as okay. good versus evil as as the book goes on like why is the cover orange we'll see yeah. The other thing I really liked is the colors of the book when you take off the, the wrapping flap or whatever. Those always interest me. And I think the colors of this one are the best. It's like a muted, faded, grayish green type thing. And then it's got this tan on the outside with red writing. I think it's like a really nice look. Much better than the previous one, which was just a black and purple. I think this one is a very pretty looking one. So I don't know if there's any meaning behind that or if it just like looks nice. But it again, this is like the brightest that the book under the cover has ever been either so i guess that's nice to be like oh look things are gonna be okay or will they oh uh, or will they my favorite aspect of this meeting is when snape and yaxley come in he tells them where to sit so the death he eaters does. have assigned seating i know and there's not even like a docent favorite. or an usher to be like pointing you gracefully no or little like table place settings with little cards telling you where you sit and like <laughs> I get that Voldemort is putting Severus to his right to mm -hmm. signify that like, oh, look at my servant. Sure. But also he's about to interrogate Severus and it's hard to interrogate someone who's sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard <laughs> to fight with your partner when you're sitting next to each other, like at a theater or something. Mm -hmm. Like you want to be across the table from each other. So <laughs> it made me laugh uh, to see that as well. And he actually mm -hmm. gets sat beside Dalahov who's mm -hmm. like, whatever. Yeah. You, you know, you'd think Voldemort who has such one for the theatrics would put Snape all the way at the other end at this long ornate table. So that picturesque wise, they could be yelling across the table, but that's not what happens. So Snape tells Voldemort that the Order plans to move Harry Potter from his current place of safety next Saturday at nightfall. The info came from, quote, the source we discussed, and they keep referring to the source as the source, so we don't know who it is. Neither to the other Death Eaters. Yeah. yeah, so Voldemort and Snape know who the source is, but they never say it to the reader or any of the other Death Eaters. So I'm guessing, or at least this is implying that someone in the Order is a mole, and I don't know who it is, or if that's even the case, or if Snape has some other way to figure out what's going on. Yeah, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So Yaxley then butts in, saying that he has heard differently. He heard from Dalish the Auror that Harry will be moved on the 30th, which is one day before he turns 17. Snape smiles, saying that this is clearly a false trail that the Order put out on purpose. Snape and Yaxley bicker back and forth a bit, but Snape ultimately says that the Order doesn't trust the Ministry anymore because they believe that the Death Eaters have infiltrated it. And then some fat Death Eater says, well, they got something right, and tries to laugh a bunch. And then the book just says, quote, Voldemort did not laugh, <laughs> which I think is phenomenal. Scary. 
<laughs> it's like, oh, come on, Death Eater. Time and place. This is not a time to make jokes. Voldemort is very serious now. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough when you make a joke like in a meeting or a dinner or something and it falls kind of flat. But mm-hmm. imagine doing that in front of like the Dark Lord. <laughs> yeah, in front of Satan. And then he just stares at the body revolving slowly overhead, lost in thought. Probably those thoughts are about how he's about to murder you yep. and make you another tear on his fucked up body chandelier. Yep. So Snape says that the new location will be the house of someone from the Order, and it will be heavily protected by charms as well as those from the Ministry. Snape thinks that once Harry gets there, he's going to be 100% safe again unless the Ministry falls before next Saturday. Voldemort asks Yaxley, oh, will that happen? And Yaxley reports that he has good news in that he was able to get the Imperious Curse on Pius Th- Thicknessy? Thickness? I, it, is his, Thickness. So his last name is literally Thickness. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, Shubes, I don't think that was in the internet vernacular in uh, 2007 that like is true. it was now. <laughs> yeah, Thickness with a K, not two Cs like it would be today. Voldemort says this is a start, but he wants all of the men surrounding Scrimgeour to be under the curse because... A failed attempt at taking the life of the prime minister or the minister of magic will set them back significantly. So they are trying to assassinate the minister for magic. Yeah. And take over the government. So, you know, it's fine. Low stakes. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not not a big deal at all. We learn that Pius is the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. And the plan is to use him in order to imperious the rest of the heads of departments at the ministry. Which is terrifying. Yeah. Oh, super terrifying that you're taking over someone that's, I guess he's in charge of the police and then trying to get everybody else taken over too so that you can make sure that you can murder the minister of magic. It's scary, but corruption, woo! Voldemort isn't confident. He says that they need to try to get to Potter while he's in transit. Snape says that the Order won't use Apparition or the Flu Network, again, going back to not trusting the Ministry. And Voldemort says that he wants to take care of the boy himself, and then says, quote, that Potter lives, or sorry, that Potter lives is due to my (laughs) errors more than his triumphs, which is valid that it's more of Voldemort consistently fucking up than Harry being a really good wizard. It's a lot of luck and circumstance that helps Harry survive. But it's also the most egotistical possible reading of the situation where Voldemort mm, is like, yeah. clearly someone couldn't have beaten me. I just messed up. But now I've learned. Don't worry. No one is better than me. I just screw up. It's like the sports trope of they didn't beat us. We lost. You know, saying that it was yeah. not them playing well. It was us playing poorly. Exactly. Voldemort tells the Death Eaters that he needs to borrow a wand from them for a task. No one volunteers. So Voldemort picks Lucius. And my initial thought is, aren't you supposed to be an Azkaban? We later learn Voldemort got him out by one way or another. Voldemort pulls out his own wand, and Lucius, for a second, thinks that this is going to be an exchange situation, and oh, he makes a slight, <laughs> <laughs> he makes a slight movement, and then realizes, oh, this is not the case. But Voldemort picks up on it and says, "Give you my wand, Lucius," and then in italics, "My wand! <laughs> I have given you your liberty, Lucius. Is that not enough for you?" So, I still support a good dunk on Lucius Malfoy because that dude sucks. And it is clear that his family is acutely uncomfortable as Mm. this is happening. We see that Narcissa is like frozen and she sort of clutches Lucius's hand under the table being like, hey, no, let's participate. Losing your wand is not the worst thing to happen Mm -hmm. possibly to you tonight. Um, And uh, and Draco is not named but is sort of referred to as just being very scared and kind of, uh, you know, nervous about the body overhead um, Mm -hmm. sitting there beside his mom. Exactly. So Voldemort presses about the Malfoys not liking his return and his presence in their home. And they try to say, oh, no, 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 no. We love you. We love you. Bellatrix even butts in. But right after she does, Voldemort drops the bomb that Lupin and Tonks got married, which, oh, yay, some light in this dark chapter. So I guess Lupin gave it some thought. So the Death Eaters then laugh about this. Bellatrix says that they've never talked to their sister once she married, quote, that mudblood. And then Voldemort actually says what I think is a pretty funny line. He says, what about you, Draco? Will you babysit the cubs? <laughs> <laughs> Which I, as much as you want to hate Voldemort, he has some good burns, some silly jokes, and some sick puns. And I can't hate the dude too much. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, he also had a pretty deft like metaphor there where you know Bellatrix gets super upset mm-hmm. that he's kind of pointing this out because she obviously worships him and wants to you know be his his queen or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and Voldemort has a kind of metaphor about like you know family trees get disease and you have to prune them, mm-hmm. which is you're like okay yeah oh, wait oh no huh and he's talking about like racial purity and like yeah. awful genocidal maniacism Mm -hmm. um which you know in my one of my previous episodes we talked about the significance of like blood purity like language of mixedness you know and how that would become significant over time this is like the clearest ever articulation of voldemort's like supremacism yet uh, where he says we'll cut away the canker that infects us until only those of the true blood remain Mm -hmm. which is horrific and uh there you go just in case you're wondering this (laughs) is uh the agenda of the guy that is precipitously close to taking over the ministry yeah he straight up lays down that all of this is down to a blood purity thing which parallels lots of evil people from the past notably oh i don't know hitler it's interesting that these books continue to unfortunately have relevance in what's going on in our current situation where we've got a bunch of immigration stuff going on and people complaining about, you know, immigration being a loss of culture for these countries. But even if you look at what happened this morning on recording, France won the World Cup and something like 80% of the roster is from Africa and 50% of the roster is Muslim. So clearly diversity is very good as it helps you be better at soccer, which Europeans are very invested in. So it's this weird thing where the books have parallels in our garbage situation that some of us are unfortunately put in now. And it just sucks that some people think that that's actually a good thing is to not have diversity. And it boggles my mind. And I hope that people read these books still today and understand the message and, and you know, kids. That's, that's the great thing about these books being kids books is that, you know, you can learn a valuable life lesson. I mean, obviously they become young adult books, but like you can learn a valuable life lesson of yes, things might not be this extreme, but you can see the parallels and Hey, you, no one should ever have a thought process like this. It's not good at all. Yeah. What Voldemort would call like dilution is actually, I don't know, enrichment and like Mm -hmm. the, the way that life actually works. And there are real like telltale signs of fascism that are, coming up in the book there's the like pageantry of leadership the the, like unquestioning uncritical mythologizing and worshiping of the leader even something as small as like insisting on where somebody else is sitting is, is like a kind of petty exercise of power that is is meant to like inform your own position and use theatrics to sort of stand in for like actual legitimacy and governance um so yeah start start your kids early we can all grow up anti-fascists uh, with the help <laughs> yeah, of harry potter which it really shouldn't be uh something that we have to it, I, I would hope that people would just get it but yes start them early on not being garbage people all right past mike take a break drink this gatorade sit down because it's time for wingardium at ridosa <laughs> Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Backblaze. Now come into my study as I tell you the story of how Backblaze saved my ass. I had to get my laptop worked on and the Apple store told me that there was a very slim chance that my hard drive could have been wiped when they did this repair. And I had just moved to New York from Seattle, so my external hard drive was still in the moving van and I didn't have it on me. So what did I do? I turned to Backblaze. Backblaze does unlimited cloud storage for Macs and PCs and it costs just $5 a month. So I set Backblaze up on my computer, I had it start to do the cloud backup, which just runs in the background of a computer, which is great. I waited until all of that successfully uploaded and then brought it into the store. Thankfully, nothing went wrong, but Backblaze put my heart and my mind at ease. Backblaze does unlimited storage, and so far they've restored over 30 billion files and they have backed up over 500 petabytes and counting. Yes, petabytes is a real thing. It is 500 billion megabytes, so they're good. (laughs) They have a great restore by mail option where basically they will send you either a flash drive or a hard drive shipped straight to your door with all of your data. You can get your computer back up and running. You can either keep those hard goods or send them back for a refund. So if you go to backblaze.com slash potteros, you can sign up for your free trial today. And then after that trial expires, it's only $5 a month. It is so worth it. That is less than half of a sandwich at most places. It is worth the peace of mind. You never have to worry about plugging in your external hard drive. It is so simple. It is so great. I can't recommend enough. Again, backblaze.com slash Potterless to start your 15-day free trial today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Stitch Fix. Look, 
Christmas just happened and you got a bunch of clothes that you don't want. How about you return all of those and set up a Stitch Fix account and get things that are perfect for you? Stitch Fix is not just a clothing delivery service. They set you up with a personal stylist, a real human being that looks at your answers to an in-depth quiz in terms of clothes you like, styles of clothes you like, your body type, your dimensions, colors you enjoy, all these sorts of things. They then take that and put together a box of five items that they know you are going to love. They ship it directly to you. You can try on all of the clothes, figure out what you like and what you don't like, keep the stuff that you want. You only pay for the stuff that you want and everything else you put in a prepaid envelope and just send it off back to them. You don't get charged for it. It is fantastic. I've gotten great shirts, shorts, and shoes from Stitch Fix. Some of my lady friends have gotten great raincoats or purses or scarves. They have so many different things and you get to determine the schedule. You can have Stitch Fix send you stuff on a regular basis. You can have it on demand if you have an event or a vacation coming up and you need new clothes. It is fantastic. And Potterless listeners get a special discount if you go to stitchfix.com slash Potterless and create your account. You will get 25% off your entire box if you keep all five items. So set up that account, fill out the quiz properly, send Send a note to your personal stylist so that the box they give you is absolutely perfect. And if you keep all five things, you get 25% off all of these already well-priced items. Again, go to stitchfix.com slash Potterless and sign up for Stitch Fix and get your fix of stitches today. So we learned that this guest who is floating above the table is Charity Burbage who apparently is a professor at Hogwarts that we've never met before, right? Yeah, Muggle Studies is a, uh, I don't I don't think it's only a seventh year class, but it is an elective. Yes, I think I knew this. It's kind of like a rhythmancy where not everybody takes it. Yes, uh, and we have not met her yet. I also think it's so uh, unfortunate and suitable that her name is Charity because mm-hmm. like deciding to understand people who are different from you is uh, like a necessary act of charity in today's age. And yet Voldemort is targeting her specifically because she represents the quote unquote like mixing of wizards and muggles that he thinks is so despicable. Exactly. So she is brought in. Voldemort mentions that she was a professor at Hogwarts until very recently and she taught students that muggles were no different from wizards. Voldemort specifically got her because she recently published a story in The Prophet about how the dilution of pure blood is actually a desirable outcome, which we have just talked about because, you know, diversity is very good and important. Yeah. And I don't know, it's a dying species. Like, yeah. that's that's not how you... Uh, I can't. All right. No, yeah. <laughs> so Voldemort, not a big fan of that, though, and decides to murder her, hits her with an Vata Kedavra, and that's the end of chapter one. So uh, the tone has been set early of what's going to happen throughout this book. Uh, this book's not messing around. No, it is not. So then we get to chapter two, which is in memoriam. And the opening line is, Harry was bleeding, which... Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Harry. <laughs> we'll get it together. So we learn it's not a severe wound. He cut his finger, and while he is trying to take care of it, he realizes that even if he was able to perform magic right now, which he can't because he's at the Dursley's house in the summer, he realizes he doesn't know any healing charms. But Tonks taught him a pisky, right? Is that not a, a healing charm? Uh, I don't think so. Hold on. I, th- I think a pisky is just a bandage, a wound. Okay, because she does it to his nose when his nose is all messed up after Malfoy, like, curb stomps him in the Hogwarts Express. Well, I think we hear Tonks say that, but I doubt that Harry remembered the spell. You know, he uses it later. She does it to him, and then he uses it, like, later in the chapter. Well, it's meant to be like a, like a quick stop for like a broken nose or a split lip. Um, okay. So that's useful as like immediate first aid. However, I don't know if that actually takes care of like incisions or maybe it's like deeper okay. than we thought. Like I'm, I'm not quite sure, but it, it did make me laugh this line where Harry thinks this seemed like a serious flaw in his magical education. And I was like, yeah, uh-huh. this is the wizarding equivalent of not teaching kids about taxes. Uh, like which, this is uh, exactly the kind of thing that we have to learn. Come on. Uh, it's so, oh uh, gosh. I, I like that should be a class everywhere is, I don't know, find something somehow you got to have just like common sense or like adult in class senior year, like make it a mandatory elective where it's like, okay, here's how you do your taxes. Here's how you invest money. Here's why Roth IRAs are good when you're young. Here's how you like all this other stuff. Yeah. That well, that I used to be home economics oh. and shop. 
you know, like that's what it used to be is like, here is, here's what you actually have to learn to like run a house or, you know, be self-sufficient. But it was like weirdly gendered. It was weirdly like a kind of post or a a wartime, like, you know, civilian education situation. Uh But yeah, it would be nice if that taught you some actual skills. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's not, not what we have. I think my high school had a civics class in our senior year where they were like teaching people who were already 18 what voting was all about. Oh, wow. I was like, oh God, come on people. Come on. (sighs) But yeah, Harry, just a few days shy of 17 is really feeling the, you know, frustration of not being able to use magic, uh, which we learn later in a kind of our segment is probably good that he's not using underage magic Mm because clearly they could come after him for it. Exactly. It's really cool. I think to have this chapter framed um, where actually I'll let you get into what Harry was doing and then I'll, I'll comment on the resonance. Cool. Yeah. So he runs in trying to go to the bathroom. He leaves his room and on his way, he steps on a full cup of tea on the floor and just crunches it under his shoe. And he thinks that maybe this is some sort of booby trap that Dudley <laughs> set up, but he can't really give it a thought. Goes into the bathroom, you know, rinses off his cut, takes some toilet paper, mops up the tea that spilled. And we learned that what happened was Harry was cleaning out his school bag completely because he always just takes off like the top three quarters of the bag each year. So there's a bunch of stuff that's found its way to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is so. wild to me that he had not emptied out that trunk in six years. How deep mm-hmm. was it? Like what kind of crap did he keep in there? Uh, everything. And we learned that there's a bunch of fun stuff down there. But before we learn what it is, I have to point out, as I always do, that JK says that he, quote, gropes his way through... Uh, <laughs> Uh, which I, uh, if I ever meet J.K. Rowling or get the chance of interview her, one of the questions will be, okay, the word grope and ejaculate, why do you like them so much? Well, I <laughs> know that you were then really excited to read this column by Elpheus Doge, who <laughs> uses some incredibly suggestive words. Mm-hmm. We'll get there. He does. He definitely does. So Harry gropes through and he pulls out a Potter Stinks badge, a busted sneaker scope, the RAB locket, And then he finds out what actually cut his finger, which was part of the broken mirror from Sirius, which is sad because now I'm reminded, oh, right, Sirius is dead. And a Cedric Um, Diggory button. So just several reminders of people that have died. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the Potter Stinks is an alternate. And that's got to be the worst one to take out because it reminds you of Malfoy, who facilitated the death of Dumbledore. And then Cedric, who was the first person that Harry saw die. So not a fun bag for him to go through. It is not. And he is like pulling out the useful stuff like his muggle clothing, his invisibility mm-hmm. cloaks, potion making kit, mm-hmm. the photo album that Hagrid touchingly put together, put into a rucksack. So our first non-trunk Harry Potter, like outerwear <laughs> accessory situation. Um, but I thought this was so funny because again, like most every book, I think when we we talked about um, book two, we were like, oh God, how annoying that we're like learning again that Harry Potter lives a private drive. You know, and Mm -hmm. and like that opening, at least for me, you know, I sort of found myself yearning for it now. Like that was a simpler time. You know, it was a simpler time where every summer Harry was bored. There were lower stakes. Yeah. The biggest concern was being bored, not being murdered. Yeah. Or being left out of the loop. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. we're like missing the Daily Prophet. But now the Daily Prophet, he has, you know, one of them for every single day of his summer so far. And they're all just reminders of like all of the crap that is happening, the world being out of his control, all of that. But especially kind of taking his trunk, which has been just like the one one constant in his life, you know, filled mm-hmm. with like these magical things that literally have like taken him out of the life that he thought he had and just, you know, needing to like pare that down, get rid of the crap, clean it out, like have an overflowing rubbish bin for sure. um, with stuff that he's throwing away. It was just like so resonant to me if anyone's like moved out of a house or packed for college or, um, you know, cleaned out a parent's house. It's like, this is a, an adulthood thing mm-hmm. and it made me kind of melancholy, you know, to picture Harry going through it. Yeah, but it was, it was good to kind of see some of the stuff that he goes through and as someone, I have moved five five times because I was in a rotational program with work. Uh, I sympathize with how much it sucks. It is not fun. Moving's the worst. So, Harry is putting together basically this rucksack of stuff that's useful. And while he's doing so, he notices the stack of profits that he has. And he grabs one and he passes through an article that mentions Charity Burbage retiring. And then he goes to the remembrance piece about Dumbledore, written by Elpheus Doge, who clearly was uh, written before the Doge meme existed. Yep. Otherwise, he would have had a different name. I I always called him Dodge in my head, but I guess I completely just threw in that extra D. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, yeah, at one point uh, later in this chapter, Rita Skeeter calls him Dodgy Doge. Oh, very good. Yeah, so I guess it'd be weird if he was Dodgy Dodge, which would be a good rapper name, though. So <laughs> he recounts that just before Dumbledore arrived at school, when he was attending Hogwarts, his father, Percival, committed an attack against three muggles and was sent to Azkaban. And Dumbledore never denied it. He said that he knew his dad was guilty. And a couple of the students thought that he might also be a muggle hater, but, quote, they could not have been more mistaken. And he goes on to very much prove that he loves muggles and is not, you know, racist and is a very strong, powerful and talented wizard. You're right, though, about the wording of this being weird, because like when he talks about his friendship and stuff, it very much kind of seems like me and Dumbledore dated without saying it. <laughs> I mean, it very well could have been. And yeah. again, we didn't, quote unquote, know that Dumbledore in Rowling's mind was gay when the book came out. So it was interesting for me to reread this now with that knowledge and hear, you know, phrases like mutual attraction, mm -hmm. which, again, is like old timey yeah. as well. You know, like people use different kinds of language and like a more heightened kind of romantic style rhetoric to discuss friendship back in the day. But I also didn't remember that uh, Albus's father was named Percival, which made me think about Percy Weasley. Uh, the true villain of the series. Who we last saw, yeah, like hanging out with Scrimgeour and like being a, a stand for the ministry. So it, it's interesting to me, you know, as we see Percy's journey throughout this book to think like, is this meant to be a parallel of some kind? I have my own thoughts, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. I hope Percy's journey through this book is a one way to get out of the book. I don't want to learn any more <laughs> about Percy Weasley when we know nothing about Charlie Weasley the best Weasley. I will never forgive J.K. Rowling. We also get to hear another mention of uh, my old favorite, Transfiguration Today, which I called <laughs> out in a previous appearance as being like, what the fuck is happening in Transfiguration that there's a different update all the time? Like, every day there's news? Every day in Transfiguration? Really? In, in recent news, uh, you know, Roberta Smythe turned a tennis ball into a uh, mongoose. So, yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, someone turned a button into a galleon so that would actually be a great twitch stream though like imagine just like a twitch stream of like banal transfigurations <laughs> <laughs> that would be very soothing or like an asmr or like some oh, yeah, yeah. unboxing video of like okay today i will be transfiguring <laughs> a fork into a quill <laughs> that would be very very good i know like people always talk about how we wish like in fandom anyway that we wish hogwarts history were real and oh, that like yeah. rolling would write that at some point which she i, I guess we'll have to, to. I know, I, I know. I learned that she was supposed to, but then it got canceled. I think Pottermore kind of is the place that she's putting out all these little tidbits, but I would also kill for a copy of like Transfiguration Physics 101. Like mm. where is the fucking like conservation of matter in Ugh. this scenario? Like I, I really want to know it. preaching to the choir, girl. I want to know all this stuff. And you know what else we need? A damn pronunciation guide. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Hermione was hard until the movies came out. Most of us were just like, I have uh, never in my life. Yeah, she had to like write Victor Crumb to yes. struggle with it to teach everyone <laughs> how it worked, Fair which I enough. think was pretty clever. So Doge goes on to write that by the end of Dumbledore's first year, he had shed any connection to his father and basically was only known as the most talented student in the school's history, which is crazy to think that a freshman is the most powerful and talented wizard that has ever come through the school. And he's only been there for a year. Yeah. And casts some interesting uh, parallels to Harry's journey again mm -hmm. in his first year where he was like the most powerful flyer to be there in a long time. Mm -hmm. His his power was incredible. His reputation was there. Albus also came in with a reputation, though a dark one. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, decided to like make a name for himself and outshone all the other students. I don't know. I'm just by picturing Harry reading this and like what parts of Albus's life are really sticking with him and which are surprising him like it's just uh, it's it's more information we've ever had about where Dumbledore came from exactly and it's something that we'll touch on later when Harry realizes this but he realizes that he's never talked to Dumbledore about anything else except for Harry Potter before yep. so if he had known this stuff he probably could have asked him about it and they could have talked since they seem to have gone through a similar path you know, it's something that Harry could have gotten a lot out of, but he's Harry Potter and so much stuff is going on. You can't really blame him, but they ultimately do just only talk about Harry's problems when they're together. So we learned that Dumbledore at Hogwarts won pretty much every award that the school has. He worked with famous wizards. He got published. And then Albus's younger brother got started at the school three years after Dumbledore did. And he was very different. He was not bookish. He thought that the best way to solve a dispute was with a duel and was just not friends with Dumbledore at all. 
when Dumbledore graduated, he and Doge were going to do the classic college thing of go travel and stuff. They were going to travel the world, visit a bunch of foreign wizards. But uh, on the eve of the trip, Dumbledore's mom passed away, making him the sole breadwinner with his dad being in prison, which sucks. Oh, it's just so yeah, bad. Yeah, it super sucks. And Elpheus and Albus were definitely not going to like make out all over Europe. That's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but sadly, Albus, yeah, has to stay home uh, where tragically his sister Ariana passes away yeah. not long after his mom. Exactly. So very shortly after his sister dies, which uh, Dumbledore just can't catch a break. It was, uh, I, I, I just feel so bad for the dude because he's so nice and just all this tragedy happening in such a short amount of time. Yeah. So when his sister passes away, Dumbledore and Aberforth take it very hard. Dumbledore still goes on to have a great life and a successful career, and he does grow closer to his brother afterwards, which is a nice silver lining at least. Dumbledore becomes the head warlock of the Wizen Gamut. Whoa! Which, what? No, it just it, sh- it shocked me to hear that. Like I, I completely forgotten, and especially thinking back over like all of the trial, you know, like the trial that he walked Harry through at the beginning of Order of the Phoenix. Um, like what the hell? <laughs> How do we not know this? Yeah, I mean, I th- in the flashbacks he was in it. Was it the pensive trip that d- that Dumbledore's there? I feel like I already knew this. Piece I knew of that he was a part of it, but not that he w- was the head. Anyway, it, it just it struck me as like this this guy's like fucking Ulysses S. Grant or something, or you know like. Like he just yeah he did a lot so of so many things. offices yeah yes I do have a question though what's the difference between a wizard and a warlock I don't know okay <laughs> I, mean, I just thought of it where uh, when he said it was head warlock I was like oh right because he's not a witch I was like wait but they call everybody a wizard I don't I have no idea maybe maybe it's uh, Alexa what's the difference between a wizard and a warlock a warlock is generally considered to be a wizard who has given into the dark arts and abused his powers. Whoa, that well, who? that's not a good title of for the Wizen Gamut. I bet it's either a political office, like you can be a judge or whatever, like you can be a warlock, or it's just gendered. I bet it's just gendered. Yeah, but I'm just wondering, like, is is wizard and warlock just interchangeable? Well, wizard, people use wizard as an umbrella term for wizards of all genders. Mm-hmm. So my guess is that in the same way that we find it necessary for whatever reason to, like, differentiate, you know, people's gender in their titles, that they use warlock mm-hmm. in the way that they would use, like, you know, I'm trying to think of an example. Yeah, so what people are saying, I'm looking, is that it depends on the author because it can either mean an evil sort of connotation like our good friend Alexa just said, or I think what you're saying where it's warlock is some sort of title representation, whereas wizard just means literally does magic. So I think your guess there is probably correct. Either that or if you're in the wizard gamut, you're evil, which I no, don't think they're is definitely right. not completely just, uh, you know, in, in like our, our evidence of their decisions. But I think it just means like judge. Yeah. yeah. So he becomes head warlock of the wizard gamut. And he also is known for having one of the greatest duels ever in 1945 against Grindelwald. So I would say that I'm excited to see that ultimate duel, but I don't want to say that I'm excited to see Johnny Depp in a film. So hopefully by the time they get to this big duel, they've recast that idiot. But we'll see. I do not have high hopes. Dumbledore's victory in this duel and its aftermath are considered one of the greatest achievements in the wizarding world. Harry realizes that even though he thought that he was close with Dumbledore after reading this, he realizes he actually doesn't know Dumbledore that well, never really talking about Dumbledore's past. There's a fun quote where the narrator says, the idea of teenage Dumbledore was simply odd, like trying to imagine stupid Hermione or a friendly blast-ended Scroot, which I will not stand for the bad-mouthing of the blast-ended Scroots. I think they are criminally underrated in this series. It was a really good line, but I must admit that my heart was hurting in this moment because Harry realizing that he never thought to ask Dumbledore about his past is like, oh, like who hasn't had that moment where someone passes away or you lose an opportunity and you think to myself like, man, like I, I had no idea or I should have taken that or I should have like, you know, asked people around me there for their stories instead of talking about my own problems. Uh, to me, it's such a like mark of adulthood. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so much about this book is about, you know, defining and entering adulthood and like going through trials that you don't particularly want to go through, but you have to go through. And to me, this is one of those, you know, where where Harry is just like, oh, damn, yes. Okay. I was I was not conducting myself the way I would like to have. 
Yeah, and it's very much a you don't know what you've got till it's gone situation yeah. where he didn't realize this until it was too late. Harry then notices that Today's Prophet has an article promoting Rita Skeeter's new book, which is a biography about Dumbledore called The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore, which, oh, oh brother. Boy. I, uh, I was thinking to myself, like, it's been, what, like three weeks? We later learned that it's been four. Mm-hmm. Not enough. Not no. enough time. No, it no, doesn't no. matter. No, not at all. The promotion for this book is an interview with Betty Bra- Braithwaite. Braithwaite? Mm-hmm. That's what we're going with. <laughs> I'll get yelled about it on Twitter, I'm sure. Harry turns to this interview and sees the picture of Rita Skeeter and and the narrator describes this as quote doing his best to ignore this nauseating image Harry read on and we learn that this biography that she's written is 900 pages and she finished it just four weeks after his death which you're right is not long enough you need more time Uh, Like it's I feel like it's even too soon if it was releasing a nice biography about him. But to release a 900 page book that basically says this dude fucking sucks. Yeah. And this interview, uh, like Rita Skeeter is a bullshit artist. Oh, by which I mean, she's very good at what she does, but also she is despicable. Mm -hmm. And like this, uh, you know, I'm sure in a book where like they were trying really hard to cut it and to like put every word to good use. This seems over long, but it's also like such a fun session. Like I spent the whole the whole like, you know, couple columns um, that this takes takes up wondering like what journalists does Rowling know and hate this much that they have come together into the like figure of Rita Skeeter but yeah she is just like completely salacious completely teasing you know stuff that she will then answer in the book and saying some very specific and very wrong things about Harry and friends exactly it is very wrong and the interview makes a note that the general perception of this book is that it's a bunch of BS Doge is even quoted saying that Skeeter's book contains less facts than a chocolate frog card. Legendary. Which is a very good quote. Skeeter claims to have access to a source from Dumbledore's youth that has never spoken publicly before, and she never reveals who it actually is, though, but says that it's someone that other reporters would have traded their wands for. She says that her book reveals secrets about his mother and his sister, who everyone previously thought was nice but shouldn't have because apparently they saw too. She also tries to downplay the duel with Grindelwald, saying it's not that great, and Grindelwald may have just simply surrendered. She says she has an entire chapter about the Potter-Dumbledore relationship, blaming Dumbledore for Harry's troubles and hinting that maybe Harry murdered Dumbledore and is just blaming Snape because he has a grudge with him, which is just ridiculous. Yep. It is, uh, it is bad. It's so bad. So Harry crumples up the newspaper and then throws it against the wall. The narrator describes it as throwing it against the wall with all of his might. But I don't know if you've ever tried to throw something that's really light. It's never satisfying and it, no, it never feels good. So it was kind of funny to be like, he hurled the crumpled up newspaper at the wall. It's like, yeah, well, probably hit the wall with a very tight and then the ground with a not thud. (laughs) Yeah, with all the other crap around his garbage can. Yeah, exactly. So then he's like pacing around his room angrily, and then at one point he picks up the tiny bit of mirror, and he's thinking about Dumbledore while he does so, and he sees in it a flash of bright blue, and there's nothing else blue in the room. He notes that it is painted an ugly peach color that Petunia insisted upon, and he keeps telling himself that he must have imagined this. There's no way that... It was actually there. He must have imagined it, which makes me think he did not imagine it. But that is the end of the chapter. So we'll have to learn about what this is later. But that's also the end of this episode of Potterless. So, Amanda, thank you so much for joining along and providing so much insight. How do you feel about this opening of the final book in the series? Uh, You're very welcome. I am absolutely delighted. A lot pops off. I was so shocked about how soon this book got into the action when mm-hmm. I first read it. And that is absolutely true here. Um, you know, Harry, I'm sure, wishes that he could have more time uh, or fewer things to do so he can, like, hang out uh, at Privet Drive um, where people make him tea, apparently, that he uh, forgets about. But <laughs> this is it. And uh, after this episode, it is uh, it is danger, Will Robinson. So thanks for yeah. having me on for our somewhat slower paced and still creepy entrance into the final chapter. 
Potter of Harry Potter. Oh, getting there, getting there. But yeah, that was one of the funny things of me going immediately from six to seven is that I'm used to the first chapters in books being like, la, 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 Harry's at the Dursleys. Or like, la, 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 here's a funny chapter about the muggle prime minister. But this one, it's like page four. There's an unconscious body upside down floating above a table. Oh, okay. We're not messing around in the Deadly House. (laughs) So I'm excited to continue. And you'll be on next episode as we talk some more of this opening. But that will be for a future time. But with book seven, uh, we're going weekly, which editing Mike probably despises, but <laughs> listeners will enjoy. So now people only have to wait one week for your next appearance. Amazing. So Amanda, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. Uh, is there anything in particular you would like to plug? You do a lot of things. Uh, I I do, including, uh, you know, run our, our little pod family multitude, mm-hmm. um, which has a new show out that I am it so does. excited about. I know that you've told yeah. your listeners about it, but I am so proud of the work that you and Eric Silver are doing on horse. Uh, it has made me care about sports in the way that this show has made you care about Harry Potter. Um, yeah. And I think that every single Potterless listener should open up your podcast app, search for Multitude, and subscribe to Horse, subscribe to Spirits, subscribe to Join the Party, subscribe to Waystation. I promise mm-hmm. that you're going to like what you find. It's some great podcasts made by great people. And yes, by the time this episode is released, I would hope that Horse is a great success and is sweeping the nation and people love it and listen to it already. But if you haven't, if you want to hear me and Eric Silver be silly and show you why basketball is fun to follow, even if you don't watch the sport, you just care about stuff like Twitter beefs and player drama, go check it out. So yeah, I like putting it in that perspective. I started this Potterless journey as a curmudgeon anti Harry Potter person that thought I would not like the series. And, you know, horse can be that same thing for you, where after just a few episodes, you just fall in love with basketball. But yes, thank you so much, Amanda, for that plug. All the Multitude shows, you can go to multitude.productions and check it out there. And yeah, thanks again, listeners, for listening. And until next time, as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, before the Death Eaters take their assigned seats at their meetings, Wizard on! It's 2019, new year, new you. Why don't you make a resolution to find new podcasts and look no further than Multitude? Multitude has so many phenomenal shows, including Potterless, Horse, Join the Party, Spirits, and Waystation. Station. They also can help with any sort of podcasting needs you have. If you want to start your own show, for any and all information about that, head to Multitude.com. Productions. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Sadie Bear, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Lopu, Alex Stark, Rebecca Admick, Frank Chioto, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfeli, Eugenia Dowse, Kieran Webb, Abita Med, Caitlin Jordan, Pontello, Benjamin Bridges, Rosemary Dosh, Jill Boulay, Marie Lisa Sikin, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivadanera, Camille Doc, Anthony Bonarigo, Russell Dunk, Dustin Wolin Cooch, Katie Rogers, Audra, Indiana Mercer, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Micah Cole, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Colette Smith, Chris. Hutton, Trina Unadcat, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Lovecash Longer, Shivarni Patel, L.A. Madsen, Calmage, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Emilia Krauss, Sean Montag, Jeremiah E. Hurd, Sarah Nink, Jesus J. Morales, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Pulido, Jessica Ann, Natalie Jung, Arna Good the Daughter, Brandy Baldonado, Melody McGinnis, Kristen Chavez, Jonathan Swaney, Zach Ross Klein, Elisa Figueroa, Tiago Costa, Daisy Carton Sauter, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grower, Jonathan Foy, Joe Harrison, Isabel, Steve Trelore, Vivian Santos, Samuel Meyer, Victoria Renee, Elena, Takari Arant, Darlene Ruiz, Brenna, Drake Perez, James Stepp, Haley Hastings, Marino, Braden Morrison, Moster, Hannah Shepard, Angelina Withred, Ross Marie Heise, Peter Bemis, Maria Vega, Phineas Ebner, Natalie Lozano, Hermione Hoff, Victoria Julian, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Bisholte, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Cecily Togbol, Raul Avila, Finn Stuckey, Mosin Sadiqui, Grace Riggle, Sammy Kurti, Raul Pineda, Ingen Oddstadter, Mary Wynn, Brian Wingate, Heidi Stoll, Alexandra Consulver, John Kotker, Jen and Juice, Sefrin Baez, Dusty Nickerum, Noel Basile, Tao, Hala O'Keefe, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Rebecca Shumway, Taya Handlin, Patricia Colon, Aaron Rapp, Jane Lance, Will Barrington, Kerry D. Baggison, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanes. If you want to find us on social media, you can go to facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, and instagram.com slash potterless podcast, or reddit r slash potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com, and for bonus content, go to patreon.com slash potterless. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a wizard on!